Hello and welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for this conversation. Uh, I'm Susie Anetta from Design Anthology and it's a great pleasure for us to be partnering with COLA on this conversation series. Tonight's discussion topic is wellness in architecture, which is part of COLA's perspective of the year, Dimensions of Wellbeing. Dimensions of Wellbeing explores the profound impact that design can have on wellbeing, particularly the importance of a clean environment and personal hygiene to nature and the overall experience of a space. Tonight's discussion features three contributors to a recent Cola magazine issue, and they're each joining us from three, not just three different locations, but three different continents. So we have a truly global event tonight. Uh, so I would love to introduce the speakers that I have with me. First of all, we have uh, Kunkrisida Roshanakorn, who is the principal of Habitat Architects, and he's joining us this evening from Bangkok in Thailand. Thanks for joining us. Hi. Secondly, we have Mpeti Morigeli, the owner and founder of MMA Design Studio, who's joining us from Johannesburg in South Africa. Thanks for joining us. Good evening. Thank you. And last but definitely not least, we have Erin Hoover, who is up very early. <laughs> She's the design director of design of luxury space at Cola Company, who's dialing in from New York in the US, of course. So uh, each of our speakers will be giving us a presentation. And when that's over, we're going to come back together and have hopefully a very interesting discussion. So I'm now going to hand over to Kun Krisida for his presentation. Hi, everybody. Uh, happy to join this discussion. Uh, the topic uh, wellness in architecture uh, is quite new to me, but I will try because I think uh, this topic uh, will be more important as, as time goes by. I think uh, we have to think seriously about uh, wellness in uh, most of our projects at Habitat are hospitality uh, projects uh, like resorts and uh, hotels and so on. And so, so the, the word wellness uh, does crop up uh, now and then. And, uh, uh, but, uh, but I have yet to, uh, to uh, I'm not aware of any shared guideline uh, regarding to a wellness uh, architecture. So I, I will have to muddle through uh, this. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we, we are fortunate that we build uh, our projects uh, in quite beautiful uh, natural uh, environment. Uh, and we have to try to uh, uh, conserve uh, this natural future as much as possible. Uh, this may be done uh, in the form of integration with nature, use of natural materials, sustainability, and giving uh, a sense of place. Okay. I have uh, selected uh, four projects, which have some features that I'm talking about. Uh, uh, three of them uh, are six cents projects. Okay. This first slide uh, is uh, uh, six cents at Minban Bay. Uh, initially, the owner would like to uh, ask us to build a water villa, which is a villa in the sea itself, like in Maldives and so on. But we found that uh, the water was too deep. So we suggest to move the villa uh, up into the rocks area uh, so, uh, uh, and integrate uh, into the, uh, the rock features. So each villa uh, uh, consists of uh, bedroom, uh, living, pavilion, uh, uh, swimming pool, and deck. Okay. So these are arranged uh, according to the rock formation. So each villa is a little bit different. Uh, so actually, you actually, as you see the small boat and so on, you actually go to Bila, uh, paddling uh, these small boats to the villa. Okay. Uh, the villas are built of uh, natural materials, uh, coconut leaf thatch, 
uh, wood, bamboo, and rocks. Okay. Uh, so this uh, natural material uh, actually blends very well with the surrounding uh, rock formation. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the Vietnamese are very good at uh, chiseling rocks and so on. So we actually managed to chisel uh, the swimming pool out the, of, of the rock formation. Uh, uh, okay, next, please. Uh, this is the the, uh, uh, the beach side villa. Okay, uh, in, uh, uh, there is a thick vegetation along the beach. Okay, and uh, so we we try to retain this thick vegetation by uh, by moving the villa back behind the vegetation. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah, uh, because I, I have a little bit problem with my. Uh, plug. Uh, anyway, uh, and uh, so the living room, in order to have the sea view, is moved up uh, on the upper floor. So you actually are looking uh, ob uh, above the vegetation uh, towards the sea. Uh, and uh, the bedroom and the swimming pool are below. Mm -hmm. uh, so next, please. So this is, uh, uh, this is in Thailand, uh, an island called Yanoi. Uh, so you approach uh, the, the resort similar to Ninh Bay, which is by boat. Okay. So from the boat, you actually don't see the resort uh, because it's hidden behind thick vegetation. Uh, and uh, next piece. So uh, here uh, you see the typical uh, accommodation, let's say villa uh, of six cents, which is the bedroom and the bathroom uh, component, then the, the pavilion, and then the swimming pool and the deck. Okay, these are the typical uh, uh, standard of the six cents. Okay. Uh, and uh, this, these villas are placed at different levels so that they overlook each other towards the sea. And uh, we try to keep the vegetation as much as possible. And we have uh, a wooden gangway and a, a walking path uh, connecting the villas. So when you walk along this wooden gangway, you have the under the tree konopi and uh, uh, they like to call this uh, Shindin um, Yoku, which is the Japanese uh, word for forest bathing, which is supposed to be very good for you. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is in Putan. Uh, uh, Six Cents has five small resorts in Putan. So it's like a relay. So you hop from one place to another. Uh, this uh, this one is in Timpu, which is the main capital, the capital of Bhutan. So you are you you are high up and you are looking down towards Timpu, and then on the left side you have the big Buddha, and uh, uh, the main facility uh, consists of the F and B and reception, and uh, the one you see on the left there is the meditation sala, and these are uh, on the podium, uh, of, uh, which is a restricting pool. And we, 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 the concept is for the uh, palace in the sky. So you're actually reflecting the, the cloud and the sun and so on, and you're actually floating uh, in this uh, main facility. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is in Punaka, which is the former capital. Uh, Punaka is uh, uh, the rice growing area of uh, Bhutan. You have a lot of uh, rice paddies and farmhouse and so on. So uh, uh, 
we, we try to bring this farmhouse feature into the project. So the, 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 the launch, which is cantilevered over the swimming pool, uh, has a form of the farmhouse. farmhouse okay? uh, and we, we, we call this uh, the flying farmhouse concept. Uh, next, please. And uh, the, the guest room, uh, 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 two stories uh, uh, on the scale of a normal farmhouse, again. Uh, next slide, please. And the interior actually is done by Six Sense uh, interior team. And uh, this reflects uh, the biophilic design theme that uh, we try to achieve. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is uh, 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 our last project, which is in Phuket. Uh, uh, this is uh, and it's under construction. The site is a former tin mine. Uh, uh, which, uh, you know, the excavated mines are now uh, became a lake and we have planted a lot of it, uh, vegetation, uh, so that it becomes a forest. Okay. Uh, the flat roofs are uh, for using uh, solar panels, so we try to uh, be as energy sufficient as possible, uh, clean energy as much as possible. People come here uh, uh, to participate in the healthy lifestyle. So you, you go through program of nutrition, exercise, meditation, and uh, special programs. Okay, so uh, uh, special wellness program. Yeah. And uh, for me, this is this is like a, a serious wellness because you, uh, whereas the other three, you actually go and. Uh, 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 in touch with nature and retreat and so on uh, without uh, having to go to a special program. But in this one, uh, you actually uh, are forced to uh, join the program. And, uh, uh, the project consists of a wellness resort and a villa for sale. So uh, this is like a big uh, wellness community. And uh, I think the trend is uh, medical resort is, is now the uh, big trend in, in Thailand. Uh, and, uh, and the timing after COVID is quite appropriate. So yeah, uh, these are the four projects that I, uh, I would like to show. Uh, uh, and I hope it uh, contributes to our conversation a bit. Thank you. Thank you, Chrisida. Uh, that's really making not being able to travel very difficult right now. I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting to Vietnam and Thailand and some of those other places very soon. Um, so now I would like to hand over to Mpeti for his uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the opportunity. I hope everybody can hear me uh, well. Um, just to start off, my presentation will focus on an aspect of wellness um, and hygiene that's not often considered or talked about in architecture. And this is the concept of mental hygiene. We often associate hygiene with your, your bodily kind of uh, hygiene, but it's not often that in architecture we talk about mental hygiene. And this is something I'm going to try and, and, and talk about how I've I've been working through this. And really the intention is to reinforce what we call the psychosomatic nature of uh, wellness. In other words, the connection between mind, body and spirit, which is often forgotten about in contemporary world architecture. Um, when we started um, looking at this, this, this topic, uh, I looked at the dimensions of wellness video by, by, by Kohler. Um, and how it relates wellness to embodied experiences. All the experiences you see in that video are about experiences that somehow reconnect us at a visceral level to the world around us. 
These experiences dissolve boundaries between self and world, where we can remember for a brief moment that we are part of the world and not just passive observers acting on the world. So over the years in my practice, I've been interested in understanding what this means through kind of ancient African wisdoms and what it means to be of this world. Um, and I've been exploring concepts such as animism and the use of rituals in architecture. So for me, it was very exciting to find parallels between my interest and the current studies in neuroscience and architecture in relation to this topic of, of an internal world of, of wellness. And for this, I borrow heavily from a book by Sarah Robinson and Johanny Palazma, which is called Mind in Architecture. So in this first slide, um, what you're seeing here is about 50 kilometers from where I am currently uh, in Johannesburg. It's an area known as the cradle of humankind. And it is one of the most important hominid fossil sites where the first Australopithecus, uh, the, our early relatives, um, the fossils were founded from about 1936 till the current day, they're still finding fossils of, of early human um, form. So this beautiful landscape contains a great number of cave sites containing fossils of our ancestors and their relatives, and is what I like to believe the birthplace of human consciousness. So as human beings, we all evolved from pretty much somewhere around these, these valleys and hills. Students of neuroscience have observed that we are biological beings whose senses and neural systems have developed over millions of years shaped primarily by the environments we have found ourselves in. It therefore stands to reason, especially in moments of uncertainty like we're in now, that we return to origins to really understand how as biological beings we experience habitat and the emotional dimensions of this experience. So in the next slide, what you see is one of the earliest forms of inhabitation in Southern Africa where people sort of built in the hillside caves and where this, according to the, the neurosciences, has impact on our psychological perceptions of place and our place in the world. From these caves, we have learned about the sense of womb-like safety and refuge provided by these tight, almost claustrophobic spaces and the sense of freedom and imagination, which is provided by prospect and long distant views. Um, the architect Colin St. John Wilson observed architecture at its best in providing us with a sense of well-being is when it allows us to experience both sensations at the same time. In other words, a sense of refuge and protection, but also having this prospect that you can look out um, into the future and, and, and um, into the imagination. Next slide, please. So in, in our mythology, in African mythology, we believe that we were born out of a rock and that ultimately we return to the rocks. And this is where the concept of animism comes in. Animism is where we attribute a living soul to plants, inanimate objects and natural phenomena. So we believe that the trees, the rocks, um, the plants all have an internal uh, character and spirituality. And we use ritual as a way of reconnecting ourselves to that other world, to the world that is not human, in order to reestablish a sense of belonging in the world. Could I have the next slide, please? Okay, so I was speaking about how we use ritual as a way of reconnecting us to this, um, to the inanimate world and to, to make it animate. And in a way, this is how we, what we call embodied ritualization. Um, and how architecture plays a very important role in creating these immersive environments that allow us to, to reconnect to our, to our origins. Um, this is a project that I've been working on for the last 10 years um, since South Africa gained its, its uh, democracy and it was really about trying to bring African mythologies and African uh, knowledge systems and beliefs into the modern world. So we're working with a lot of um, different um, experts, I would say, in knowledge, whether it's traditional healers, 
um, faith-based organizations to try and, and get to the bottom of, of what it means to, what did they say? To, to dwell authentically in the world. Next slide, please. The project had some memorial aspects to it. Um, and the memorialization is really about bringing the elements of, um, the primary elements of life. In other words, earth, wind, water, fire, and space into a, a juxtaposition that creates a heightened awareness and understanding of the laws of nature. And as the yogis say, a path to the attainment of greater health, power, knowledge, wisdom, and happiness. So this juxtaposition of, of elements um, arises out of a deep intuition of, of how the universe operates. Next slide, please. The internal spaces in that project, um, trying to recreate the sensations of coming out of a cave or having dwelled in a cave. Um, Mark Johnson, who speaks in the same book, describes how space is experienced through movement and the various forces acting on the body, including gravity. And spaces can encourage a heightened sense of these forces acting on our bodies through the kind of ge geometric arrangements uh, that replicate how caves are formed. So this is an example of how you try and create a heightened sense of self through the, the, the recreation of these um, twisted forms. So as he goes on to say, movement and containment are our point of departure for living in the world and making a sense of it. Next slide. This is a conference center in the same location, the cradle of humankind. Um, it's got a conference center and a museum of paleontology. And it was built in a way to encourage the idea of immersion into the bosom of the earth and kind of going back to origins. There's always this thing of going back to where we originate from, similar to what's done in, um, I think it's the Pueblo Indians when, when they have their kivas. Um, this kind of belief that everything, the source is from deep within the earth. And you know, there's a transitional space that happens between the two. Next slide. So in more contemporary environments, this is a house I designed, uh, which tries to understand some of those concepts. Um, it's, a, it's a house in Johannesburg. And Johannesburg is, is a product of its geology. The presence of dolomitic limestones, which eroded, which were eroded by water created caves. These caves that we find all over Johannesburg. And this is how life emerged. So this metaphor of the cave has been used in this house as an example um, to try and create the sense of a hollowed out outcrop that enables both sanctuary and prospect at the same time. So your the, the, the building, if you go to the next slide, is almost designed to as if it was a, a piece of granite which had been hollowed out uh, through the passage of water and time. And that basically as human beings, we, we found places almost like caves that we could inhabit um, in the way that the house opens up completely to, to the environment. Um, and in this way, we're trying to bring back the idea of, of, of sanctuary and sanctitude, but also the importance of having that prospect and that sense of being part of, of a wider and a bigger world. Next slide. And I'll just conclude by saying uh, light and time are two important dimensions in architecture. The daily movement of the sun and the passing of the seasons have always been celebrated by ancient cultures through their architecture. So in conclusion, wellness springs from the unity of body, mind, and spirit. Love and belonging, one of our primary needs as humans can be reenacted through ritual spaces that enlist all the body senses in a deep, meaningful way. So I'll end with a quote from Palasma. As architects, we need to be reminded that architecture is more an art of the body and existential sense than one of the eye. Thank you.
Thank you, Empathy. That was, uh, there's a lot of really great takeaways from there. I think, you know, when you said being of this world and to dwell authentically in the world really resonated with me. And I feel like many of us in the last 12 months have had an opportunity to actually understand what that means. Uh, I'm going to now hand to Erin um, for your presentation. Lucky last. All right, thank you. Um, well, today I'm going to talk a little bit more about Kohler's Perspective of the Year, Dimensions of Well-Being. So perspective, Kohler's Perspective of the Year, Dimensions of Well-Being, looks at the connection between physical spaces and personal well-being, how we interact with a space and how it responds to our needs, with an emphasis on our personal habits and hygiene and their role in our mental, physical, and spiritual health. Focusing on a particular theme each year allows Kohler to have a global conversation with thought leaders, architects, developers, designers, and others about how these macro trends will shape the future of architecture and beyond. Next slide. This quote speaks to Kohler's mission of gracious living and our need not only to understand how people want to live now, but also how they want to live differently in the future. Kohler's perspective of the year creates a context for meaningful dialogues with those who will shape our future, architects, developers, and designers. Next slide, please. The spaces we inhabit have a profound effect on our well-being. This has become even more evident during the COVID pandemic. By designing beautiful spaces that meet our need for hygiene as well as beauty. Architects and designers have the power to affect uh, major change and contribute to well being on a personal, social, and environmental scale. The Park Royal Hotel in Singapore, designed by Woha, was designed to be a hotel in a garden. It features extensive greenery, including green walls, water features and 50,000 square meters of, tire, of tiered sky gardens. The hotel sky gardens are designed to be self-sustaining and consume minimal energy through the usage of solar, shell, solar cells, motion sensors, rainwater harvesting, and reclaimed water. Next slide. We know that the pandemic has already had a profound impact on how we think about spaces, both public and private. We became hyper vigilant about hygiene and overall physical health for ourselves, our families, and greater communities. And we search for ways to maintain our sanity and our happiness during these unprecedented times. Next slide. And we know that previous infectious disease outbreaks have had, in, have had a big influence on the design of the modern bathroom and other spaces in the home. A convergence of advancements in science, infrastructure, plumbing, sanitation, and design trends change standard fixtures, wall covering, flooring, finishes to promote health and hygiene in the home at a time of widespread public health concerns. Past epidemics have changed how spaces are designed from the creation of the powder room to enable household members to wash their hands prior to entering the main portion of the home to the use of more sanitary surfaces like porcelain tile, cast iron and nickel plating. The modernist aesthetic with its cleaner lines to reduce dust collection and more windows to ensure sunlight and fresh air for a healthier space was another shift influenced in part by past epidemics. Next slide, please. What also became very clear over the past year is how much we need a connection with nature. We've known for some time about the positive impacts on our physical and mental health when we connect with nature and nurture our senses. Spending as little as two hours total a week in a green space can reduce blood pressure and stress while increasing short-term memory and improving sleep. 
fundamental qualities of wellness are even more meaningful for adapting to a post-coronavirus environment, incorporating natural light, natural ventilation, and connection to green spaces and landscape. Next, please. Increased acceptance of biophilic design principles and a renewed reverence and respect for the importance of the natural world will hopefully continue to influence how we create our living spaces. The pandemic reinforced the importance of sustainable sourcing and selection of materials and a focus on local architecture and craftsmanship as a means to build a sense of community and resilience. Stefano Boeri designed the Forest City as a pilot in a series of mini sustainable cities that could become a template for future cities in China. These cities will be self-sufficient, helping to de decrease the average air temperature, improve local air quality, create noise barriers, generate habitats, and improve local biodiversity in the region. They will run on renewable energy, especially solar and geothermal. Next, please. Another important outcome of the pandemic has been a renewed sense of appreciation for the domestic space. As we look at products designed for the home, we're focusing on a wide range of design issues, stressing self-sufficiency, flexibility, sustainability, health, wellness, and hygiene, along with a renewed interest in public versus private space. Next. Alongside the, alongside the embrace of the benefits of experiencing the natural world, the pandemic also accelerated the integration of te technology in the home, facilitating hygiene and cleanliness, as well as personalization, relaxation, and comfort through touchless technology and smart home apps. And we believe this trend is here to stay. Next, please. 2020 accelerated trends in architecture, interior design, technology, and well being in both public and private space. How will we evolve these spaces to facilitate our hygiene and health while still providing joy? Next. 2020 was a year of disruption and uncertainty. But at Kohler, we're optimistic about the opportunity to shape our future in pursuit of well being for ourselves, our families, community, and the environment. It's a challenging time, but also it's an exciting time to be engaged in a dialogue with the design community and our other partners. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Uh, I'd like to now welcome everybody back to participate in a group discussion. Uh, Got a couple of questions here. I'm not sure how much time we have for all of them. There's a lot of questions that come to mind after each of your presentations, but I thought I might start with one about obviously the built environment given tonight's topic um, and the history of architecture and, and man-made structures and the built environment that we are living in, um, given the history of that. But the conversation around well-being in architecture seems relatively new by comparison. So I wanted to read a short quote by the author Ben Channon from a book of his called Happy by Design. And the quote is, given that we spend over 80% of our time indoors, shouldn't we have a better understanding of how architecture makes us feel? And I would like to invite each of you to respond to that. And, and uh, yeah, I would like to hear your thoughts of what that quote makes you think of. Who would like to go first? Well, I can certainly um, speak to something that, that I was really struck by during Mpethi's, um, uh presentation. You know, when he was showing us the cliff dwellings um, in South Africa, I was thinking of very similar cliff dwellings that are in Southwest of, of the United States. So I think there there is, you know, and that is based on, as, as he was saying, you know, this notion of refuge and prospect and the fact that we are, we are most comfortable, let us say, in, in a space where we feel protected and enclosed and, and comfortable, but with a wide view. 
And, and that seems to be something that we've known about, but maybe we forgot. And, and we are maybe returning to that notion now. Would you like to add to that, Mpeti? Yeah, um, somebody recently said that because the majority of people, over 50%, are now living in urban areas. And as you've rightly said, we spend 80% of our time indoors. Does that now mean that our natural habitat is a built environment? It's no more the natural environment. Um, and if that's the case, then we almost need to understand what was it about our natural environment that made us feel well and made us feel joy and made us feel connected. And how do we recreate that in this artificial environment that we are now being forced to live in? So, yeah, I think it's, it's trying to learn from nature through whether it's biophilic design or through understanding the origins of human beings as, as biological forms um, that we need to then bring to this artificial environment we're being forced to increasingly live in. Mm, it's a very powerful thought, I think. Uh, Chrisida, do you have anything to add to that? Well, uh, you know, I, I live in the tropics, okay? So in the tropics, um, uh, you, you, you tend to live outdoors, okay? This is very comfortable, you know, or in the pavilion, shaded pavilion, you call it sala, or under a tree and so on, you know? And uh, you actually go indoor, uh, you know, uh, if you look at the tradition house, it's more for security than for living, you know, you keep your things there and so on. So, uh, but you need a good environment for that, okay? Uh, it, it, uh, you have to be, uh, you know, by the uh, uh, trees and, you know, uh, greeneries and so on. But in, in a urban setting, you know, where you have uh, the noise, the pollution from the noise and the air pollution, uh, it's difficult to live, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, tradition, this type of architecture doesn't survive in a bad environment, okay? So, um, uh, and we, because of the, uh, the the price of the land, we are forced to go high and, uh, uh, and mechanize our environment, you know, air condition and so on. Uh, uh, you know, and, but uh, it's, but we still haven't solved the problem. We, we actually, uh, you know, uh, trying to forget the problem, but it, once you walk out, you, you still have the air pollution, the noise and so on. And I think we have to think about that. Because uh, uh, maybe the solution is uh, that the car will go electric, or you have more greeneries and so on. But that requires a lot of political will to do that. Uh, so uh, I, I'm, I'm, that's challenging. Okay, and uh, mm. I don't think you will solve it in my lifetime. You know? So bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> That's a sad thought, but they're very important <laughs> points that you've raised. Um, I, I wanted to, you know, go back to the obviously mental well-being, and you know, I think so many of us this year have been so much more acutely aware of of what that is and and what, how we sort of maintain that, and perhaps the role and the importance of having a refuge or a sanctuary. And I think traditionally we perhaps think of that as home, but so many of us have spent so much more time at home or maybe only at home. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you about how you feel about that. Is it, you know, is it important? What role does it play? And does it have to be home if we're searching for a sanctuary or a refuge? Obviously at the moment, maybe we have no choice for it to be <laughs> anywhere other than home, but um, who would like to comment on that? Petty, do you have any thoughts? Um, I think we, well, certainly for us here during the, the lockdowns uh, where we were forced to be at home, um, we almost created that ref, those series of refuges. So it would be home where you go to buy food and maybe where you, you go for other necessities. And between those, you create these kind of safe passages that 
often are using green spaces as much as possible away from other people. Um, so it's almost like you, you're creating this bubble, um, this bubble of safety um, that you kind of traced your roots through. And that became, that became a ritual of every day almost that, you know, from your home, you head through a green way into a particular shop at a particular time when there's less people and then on to another space and then back. So your world became a very small, apart from the home as refuge, your, your community became almost your refuge. Um, you know, your immediate community and you never ventured further than what walking distance. For, for us sometimes for it must be two months, something like that. So it, it really brought out an awareness of community as refuge beyond, beyond the home as well. It's mm, a really good point. What about you, Erin? Do you have any thoughts on you know, the important role that that might play? And did you have any particular places that became your refuge during, uh, I guess, you, is New York still in lockdown? Uh, no, we we are we are emerging from from lockdown. But um, yeah, I I agree. I'm very very similar. Um, where for me, you know, my my refuge was actually going up on my roof every morning. So I'm I'm lucky where I am in New York. I actually have a really expansive view. So again, we're, we're going back to refuge and prospect, um, where I could stand there and I could see the entire city. And also, you know, what New York has is, you know, we have a lot of rooftop gardens, so I could see some greenery. And then, you know, as things got a little bit better, the same thing, you know, I live, I live very close to Washington Square Park, so I will walk down there and it's, yeah, it does become these sort of little rituals where, you know, if I can walk down there and I can walk, you know, and see the trees and sort of walk around in a safe way and then come back into my space and you know somehow that makes you feel renewed and refreshed. Mm. And what about you, Chrisida? Did you have a special place that you found refuge in during this past 12 months and perhaps ongoing? Well, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm semi-retired here. So I, I come to Bangkok uh, two days a week and I stay in Fuhin, which is a beach town, three hours drive outside of Bangkok, okay. That is my sanctuary, okay, because uh, in contrast to Bangkok where you have all these noise and you're not, there you have, uh, you know, greeneries, you're quite exposed to uh, the wind, breeze and so on. Uh, and, uh, you, know, uh, I, you know, you can sort of, uh, even in the COVID you know, lockdown, I was able to survive quite nicely because uh, you have garden to, you know, you're quite exposed to uh, all the natural uh, surroundings and so on. Uh, whereas if I was to live in Bangkok, you know, in my house in Bangkok, I would have struggled a lot. Okay? So uh, 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 I think the sanctuary is a luxury, actually. You know, I, I, I think the, I could not ha have afford such a sanctuary in the urban setting because the land would be too, too costly. But uh, in the rural area, you have more lands and so on. So it can become a sanctuary. Okay? And I think uh, it helps you to revive all the stress and so on. And uh, uh, I think it's important. Mm. And that is what we are missing. Yeah, I think you've raised a good point. It's also very important, I think, to recognise that that some of us are incredibly privileged um, during this time and and have a refuge or a sanctuary. And it's you know it seems evident that um, the, that those of us are that are in that position have sort of sought to be outside and reconnected with nature in a way. Um, but my my final question is actually almost the polar opposite of that, and it's it's about technology. And I would I would love to ask each of you about where you think technology fits into this conversation. Do you think that it helps with a sense of well-being? Is it an enabler or do you think it's a hindrance? You know, each of us has, uh, you know, a little device never very far away. Um, <laughs> does it make it impossible to relax and find a sense of, of kind of mental calmness or are all of these new technologies that Erin alluded to, are they... Are they really helping us? Um, 
Maybe Erin, do you want to start because you touched on that sure. a little bit in your presentation? Well, I, I mean, I think I think it is actually, you know, certainly for me as a designer, it, it's one of the biggest, um, I think, questions we have to answer because, you know, it, it became so clear that we we are so, I mean, we know this, but, you know, it's so easy to forget. We are so hard, hardwired to need to be connected to nature. Um, nature. Nature makes you more, feel more present. You're more in the moment. Technology, on the other hand, while undoubtedly there are benefits, um, undoubtedly there are, you know, things that we are able to do that we, I think now we, we must do um, to solve some of the issues that we have in the world um, is the thing that takes you out of the moment, makes you less present. So I think, you know, as designers, I, I don't think it's possible to think about creating spaces or creating products that don't incorporate some level of technology, but how can we, how can we balance that? I think is, is one of the big, biggest questions that, that we're facing. Mm, balance is a good word. Uh, Chrisida, would you like to add anything to that? Do you feel that technology has helped you or you know, create a sense of, of well-being throughout this time? Or do you think that it's, um, you know, is, is it really also about balance, finding balance with the technology? I think uh, uh, it's about finding balance. Okay? And I think uh, uh, like technology, like air condition uh, you know, and uh, hot water, refrigeration or phone and so on, these are very good for us. Okay? But uh, we, we have to, uh, we don't, we should not overdo it, okay? Uh, and really dis disregard the surrounding, you know, you don't care whether outside is uh, uh, how bad, you know, because you're, you're, you're inside your cocoon and so on. I think uh, uh, we need to uh, keep a balance and uh, try to uh, uh, upgrade, you know, our surroundings and so on, so that uh, uh, we can use less technology, you know, and survive, uh, uh, sustainably, yes. And do you have any perhaps final thoughts and petty for us on that subject? Um, it's interesting that I think that question would probably be answered differently by different generations. Um, I mean, I look at my my kids and the way they've like adopted technology. Um, they're able to spend hours and hours um, in social groups online. And for, I think our generation, it's probably much more difficult. Um, but what's been more interesting for me is within the, the kind of creative process of, of design and architecture, understanding what it is that we can collaborate on remotely and what that we actually need to do in person. Um, you know, this idea that everything can now be done remotely, I feel is not quite correct. And there are certain aspects of co-producing co that we, we, we are learning, beginning to learn now that actually have to be done with, you know, people sitting across a room looking at body language and all of that. So I think that the body language aspect of technology and what it it, it, it misses is going to be an interesting thing to see as we go as we move forward. Yeah, I couldn't agree mm -hmm. more. Well, yeah. I mean, obviously, technology definitely has its benefits. It's brought the four of us together. Um, I want to say yes. this evening, but it's very early in the morning for Erin in New York. It's uh, <laughs> midday for Impeti in yeah. South Africa. It's late afternoon for Chrisida in Thailand, and kind of late evening for me in Melbourne. So. On that note, I'm going to wrap up and say thank you to all of you again for your time, for joining us, your presentations and your thoughts. It's been really wonderful getting to meet you all, even if it was remotely. Um, so thank you all very much. And thank you for everyone that's tuned in to watch tonight. I'd like to invite you to stay online a little bit longer to watch uh, a video from Cola, which explains their perspective this year, the dimensions of wellbeing. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye.
Polar has always been in the business of well-being, even before it was a, a word in our lexicon. To us, well-being is at the core of what we do. Well-being isn't new. It's being redefined in holistic and really personal ways. We use the term dimensions of well-being. It's not just one dimension, it's multi-dimensional. Well-being actually means many things. It could mean relaxation and tranquility or energy and liveliness, but it also means cleanliness and the peace of mind that comes along with it. Our perspective of the year touches on all of those meanings. Dimensions of well-being is a very simple idea at its core. It's about space and its effect on us and how we interact with each other and the mood that we have for the day. If I go out into the world feeling positive and energetic, I'm affecting those around me just as they are affecting me. The bathroom is actually the hub for well-being. Sometimes it's the only space in which you have privacy and you're able to disconnect. So we see the bathroom evolving. It's not just a task-oriented space, it's a living space. With new materials, new technology, and new manufacturing methods, we could make a bathtub look like a piece of furniture or make a faucet and shower look like a piece of art. That actually allows architects and interior designers to have more creative options to design around their space. Aesthetically pleasing spaces have value, but they also have to function properly. So traditionally, if you want to get your bathroom experience right, you have to go around turning things on and off, tweaking, adjusting, just to get it right for you. We want to make your whole bathroom experience seamless, touchless and automated. With smarter bathroom technology, hygiene and cleanliness becomes effortless. And that allows us to design spaces that supports complete well-being. At Kohler, we have a depth and a breadth of products that allow us to meet users at many points along their well-being journey. a and have a profound effect on the people who inhabit the spaces they create. Dimensions of Well-Being calls attention to the power of architecture and design to reshape our habits and hygiene enabling us to form a deeper understanding of ourselves and the connection to the world around us.